Q&A segment of VXTV Live. Uh, and the first question is from the Viking of Valsin. I love that name. Uh, he said, how was the experience playing, training and traveling with an MLS club like Atlanta United compared to Europe, the Premier League and TNT? That's a very good question. I like that. Um, different, different, different cultures. Um, the sports itself, you know, you have different feels to it. Um, traveling to the country had a different level of importance and feeling and euphoria. Um, in Europe, you know, that's your job, the excitement, everything. That That is also different. You know, you're, you're playing where someone is seeing you on TV every weekend and in front of fans, uh, 40, 50, 60, 70,000 at times. Um, and then playing for the MLS, it was kind of brand new because, yes, because of American culture, but also the way in which the sport is set up and the interaction with the fans and, and the things that you do at games and that type of stuff. Um, was 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 it was it was all different, but you know, uh, an experience nonetheless. Wow, interesting. I always wondered, you know, how, what that was like. So this guy asked my question. Okay. So, <laughs> so the next question is a tweet from Shotter underscore Cage. Interesting. Mm -hmm. um, he said, "Do you listen to the Peter Crouch podcast? How was he as a teammate after the World Cup?" I should ask Brett that. But... Um, no, well, I, I don't listen to the um, Peter Crouch podcast, but me and him did have a have a have a chat about that um, when we became teammates at well, we were teammates at Southampton first before the World Cup, mm -hmm. and then um, after the World Cup uh, at Stoke, we were teammates again. Um, we had a little chat, we had a laugh about it, and you know, he was like, "I'm probably the most hated manager in that right now," <laughs> but the thing is. You know, I, I didn't even know that I was doing that. It's just like reflex action of of the things that you do when you get up there. Normally, you have people who put hands on shoulders. Yeah, it might get a little push before you go up in the air. But that was a um, that was a a reflex action moment. You know, not not something that you're conscious of doing during that time. I mean, we had a laugh about it. I mean, he is a ter terrific teammate. To be honest, he's a cool guy. I used to have fun, you know, when he's training, when he's in the dressing room, he's really good to be around. Yep, you know, yeah, you could tell he had a little quirkiness to his personality with some of his celebrations. I know he did his little robot thing and then uh, for a little while. So that was interesting. I always wanted to know his perspective because I know recently, I think he's, he told uh, uh, Nunez from ESPN uh, that he, you know, he felt bad, it wasn't intentional. And he said the same thing. So. It's interesting to hear it from his mouth and yours as well. So, very good question, um, K. Shotter Cage. I love that name. Okay. <laughs> so this this one is a ooh, this one is a little wordy though. This is from Rudy Nimai from Calgary in Canada. So from all over the planet, folks. Uh, Concacaf countries seem to be below the standards of the top regions. What has been the cause of this change, and why haven't the Caribbean regions been able to elevate? their teams? Um, That's a heavy question. Well, CONCACAF teams, CONCACAF teams are behind because I think we're also behind in attraction and funding. Um, Caribbean teams more so. Um, if you want to play this sport, you have to have the facilities to be able to produce um, talent that you want. Also, I think our coaching education needs to be a bit more inclusive and also evolve a lot in order for us to, 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 to be better. Yes, we have our own identity in the Caribbean islands for style of play and, and all of that, and which is fair to find, but also the coaching methods and, 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 and education and, and like I said, funding and facilities and everything. Thing that actually goes into the game because a lot of people don't understand what actually goes into making a professional player. Professional players need from probably the age of 13, 14, the kind of investment that goes into making that person a superb version of themselves is ridiculous. You know, the, 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 the psychology, the strength training, the strength and conditioning training, the, the nutrition, um, is, is, is a hell of a lot of investment and I don't think that we invest enough in that throughout the region 
we just think that you know our talent will do the best and also we have a very archaic mentality that you know we're coming from here so we want it more than them but we're in the age of technology and not only technology that you hold in your hands and devices but technology into the human being and how to make them stronger faster you know that type of thing and and, and it's not something that we have the opportunity to invest in for whatever reasons so we're going to continue to be in the minnows of, of world football if we continue like that Yep, you know, I, uh, I myself, you know, I saw, although people know me as the media guy, you know, I, I did some work around uh, around some national teams and, you know, Central FC and you know, Houston Dynamo and I saw the contrast and how things are approached and it's it's the excuse, you mentioned it just now, you know, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot that needs to be changed. That's an entire topic by itself. So it's not an overnight change and it's not where you flip a switch and it, it goes, there's a lot of things. That needs to be changed. It first, it first begins to respect yeah. for what we do. Mm-hmm. This is not, um, I mean, when I got to England, my childish love for football and fun went out the window when you realize that it is a job and the seriousness about it. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think that we here, we don't, res- people may call it professionalism and all of that, but we don't respect football and football business in the Caribbean island. So a lot of the things we think we can get away with, we can't. And we're so far down the hole now that it's going to be a, 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 a long way to throw it. A simple thing in CONCACAF is that you have players from the CONCACAF region, um, CFU region, past footballers who've had experiences playing certain places. And for their member associations of their country, for the CFU, um, for the CONCACAF. In this region, we have no representation or no input from these um, past players in our associations. How come we are not ambassadors for CONCACAF and going around to countries to be able to, you know, lend our knowledge and even our member associations, places that we are from, we have no involvement in them. So they're not calling on their experience to, to be able to, to help develop in anything in, in whichever um, aspect, whether it be administratively, um, in, in, in training, that type of thing. We have, we have no involvement because you have very few players who had the highest level of experience in club football and um, international football in the Caribbean. Very few. You know, just yeah. You know, to, just to, to build on what you're saying, uh, a perfect example of what you're saying was um, I was uh, with Central FC in the Concacaf Nations League when they were playing LA Galaxy, and it was a casual conversation. We met, you know, some Trinidadian people there because Trinidad and Tobago people seem to be everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And uh, you can't go anywhere uh, without finding them. So uh, they came up and they were very gracious and hey, you know, Trinidad. And when they said Trinidad, they assumed it was a national team, but you know, because they saw John, Michael Williams, and the other guys. And um, a conversation took place. I can't remember who it was, but uh, it was around the LA Galaxy guys because we were, you know, just doing the whole me- crowd, yeah. Yeah, meeting and greet and so on. And it was myself and a couple reps from the LA Galaxy. So one of the ladies uh, from the group, there was a group of them. And, you know, they were very, you know, patriotic. Oh, I love Trinidad and Tobago. But it showed a misunderstanding where she asked, she said, so what do you guys do when you're not playing football? And everyone kind of looked at each other, bemused. You know, we were like, what do you mean? You know, they, I understood as a Trinidadian what, what the person meant. That they simply didn't understand that this is a job. These people do this for a career. And it was... It was you're, quite you're an eye-opener saying for that me. Yeah, based on the interaction with them. Yeah. It was. You're saying that based on the interaction with them. But yeah. right, right, right here in Trinidad and Tobago, we don't respect it as a job. Yeah. It is something that we do. It, it, whether it be by players, whether it be by clubs, whether it be by the associations, whether it be by the general public, we don't respect it as such. So therefore, you're not going to have 
people actually living and breathing football. I'm not talking about coming out in the street and thinking that, yeah, well, I'm going to take a sweat here, there, and everywhere. I'm talking about you being 24-7 contracted by a club, um, working in your off season and going to it like a regular job. We don't respect it like that. Like I say, we don't respect football business. Yep. So it is never going to be treated like that. It is always treated like an occasion. Absolutely. Because, no matter, because when you look at it, no matter what you do, a police officer is a police officer, whether he's on duty or off duty. He can arrest you when he's off duty. You understand? So it, we can't be a, a, a football player or when the season starts or when the national team have a game. Yep, it's, it's, it's quite a, in, a terrible misconception. And you know, it, uh, you know Rudy, I got a good, uh, a good detailed answer to your question there because that is a, that is a legitimate problem. And as Ken Wynn elaborated there, and I've experienced it as well and seen it. It's, there's a lot of education needed all around. So, our next question is a video. All the way from Malaysia, from Sivan John from the Bola Bola Show. Hi, Kenwin. I'm Sivan of the Bola Bola Show from Malaysia. Uh, I would like to take you back to the November 16, 2005, when Trina Tobago were going to play Bahrain in Manama. Uh, I wanted to know what was your your thought on going into that game and what was your feeling like right after when the referee blew the final whistle knowing that the soccer warriors have clinched an historical birth at the 2006 world cup in germany thank you well Stephen jung um in in that particular moment going to, to Bahrain, i think the team we were optimistic we had a fighting chance we literally seen what Bahrain has um, you know the combination of our team was probably a little bit different when we went to Bahrain to play the game but our players we were excited anxious um, going into that game because you know we're on the cusp of history for ourselves for our families for the country um, so we were both excited and nervous at that time and when you know after the game when they blew that final whistle I can remember players actually jumping around um, for me, it was a very, um, I was excited, but not actually, you know, t taking into account the, the the history that was made, the achievement that was just made. Um, I was just happy. I was crying. You know, I called my dad from the dressing room, um, told him we made it because my dad used to play um, football. Um, my uncle, he was a part of our 1989 uh, strike squad. And he was, you know, an integral part. So I called him as well, and you know, we had a cry over the phone because at that point in time, I was fulfilling, you know, their legacy and their dream, and not actually taking into account that me at 21 years old, you know, going to the World Cup, coming from Trinidad Tobago. I think it's only later on in my career, or maybe when I retired, I actually got a chance to sit back and and and, and look these things and actually taking the moments of something that might possibly never happen again who knows um so being a part of history in that regard is, um, is an amazing thing yeah you know my paws are raising you can't see it on my non-hd camera but you know i was a fan i i called in <laughs> called in sick that day to watch that game i remember you know i listening to your story is exciting that was we, exciting we call in sick we call it we, we call in sick for any occasion in trainer <laughs> Well, I tried to ignore that part, but uh, okay. but you know, it was that was an exciting time. So hearing you tell that story, so Sivan, you know, j not just for Kelvin, but for all of Trinidad and Tobago, that was one of the few times in our country everything was happy, n everything was cast aside, and we were only focused on football. It was a beautiful time, and you know, it's it's something that left fond memories for all of us, and it's uh, you know, we try to remember it as much as possible, and hopefully it will come again soon. So you know. Uh, we have that's we try to squeeze in as much questions as we can so folks be sure to like and subscribe comment in the comment section below send questions for kenwin shaka myself if you all feel like asking me a question i don't know why and uh you know we we look forward to your questions and you know it's it's amazing and i appreciate uh, the support that i'm getting from you know malaysia uh, uk trinidad tobago the us canada um it means a lot uh so kenwin that's the end of the q a segment for now. Yes.
Just a reminder everyone, for more episodes, be sure to head over to our YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to subscribe for more updates, interviews and content.